Apple encourages big thinking but small everything else. Meeting size is a good example. Once Shy at Day was installed as Apple's agency of record and we'd settle into our work, we would meet with Steve Jobs every other Monday. Typically, there would be no formal agenda. We'd share our work in progress with Steve, and he'd share whatever news he had. One particular day, there appeared in our midst a woman from Apple with whom I was unfamiliar. I don't recall her name, and she never appeared in our world again, so for the purpose of this tale, I'll call her Lori. She took her seat with the rest of us as Steve breezed into the boardroom, right on time. Steve was in a sociable mood, so we chatted it up for a few minutes, and then the meeting began. Before we start, let me just update you on a few things, said Steve, his eyes surveying the room. First off, let's talk about iMac. He stopped cold. His eyes locked on to the one thing in the room that didn't look right. Pointing to Lori, he said, who are you? Lori was a bit stunned to be called out like that, but she calmly explained that she'd been asked to attend because she was involved with some of the marketing projects we'd been discussing. Steve heard it, processed it, then hit her with the simple stick. I don't think we need you in this meeting, Lori. Thanks. He said. Then as if that diversion had never occurred and as if Lori never existed, he continued with his update. So as the meeting started in front of eight or so people whom Steve did want at the table, poor Lori had to pack up her belongings, rise from her chair, and take the long walk across the room towards the door. Her crime, she wasn't necessary. Now, that's a story from the book that I'm going to talk to you about today, which is Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple's Success by Ken Seagal. Um, I'm going to cover it for a few reasons, and I want to quickly talk about why I think this is such a special book. Um, so, you know, we've started a couple of, we've started to cover a handful of books about Steve Jobs, and we're covering things like I, Steve, which is this wonderful compilation um, of a bunch of quotes throughout his lifetime. We're covering Make Something Wonderful, which was published by Love From, and is this like wonderful, um, just dedication to who Steve was and, and a lot of his best ideas and speeches. Um, we're going to cover some of his biographies, including Becoming Steve Jobs. Um, but one of the books, you know, there are very few books outside of kind of being explicitly about Steve, I think, that really give an insight into Apple and the culture that Steve created and helps demystify and explain some of why Apple's been able to be so successful. And I think this book I would nominate is probably the best book outside of those to understand Apple. And it's for two really important reasons. Uh, number one, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a background on Ken Seagal and talk about who he is in a moment. Um, but what is unique about this book is it's written by someone that worked directly with Steve on very important high profile campaigns like Think Different, who was also a part of naming the iMac and coming up with this i naming framework that's now been used prolifically on iPad, iPod, iPhone. Um, so he's actually worked with Steve and the stories that are in this book come from all of his uh, basically interactions with Steve. And so we get this firsthand perspective of how Steve and how Apple makes decisions and how they approach um, you know, trying to define products and trying to think through things like naming or pricing, uh, these things that can be very esoteric, can be very complex, can be very hard to wrap your head around. Um, so that that that's kind of one re reason is this is kind of direct insight into what Steve was actually like. But the other is this book works really powerfully on two levels. Um, you know, insanely simple. Clearly, a lot of the examples we're going to talk about here are about creative work. And, you know, for the purpose of, from Ken's perspective, it's not so much crafting products, but it's crafting marketing campaigns naming, pricing, uh, and, and product strategy because he wasn't as he was more involved in the marketing storytelling side as, as, as he, that he was in the product creation side. Um, but the ideas in here, I think, are applicable uh, both when you're creating a product, whether it's a physical product, whether it's a digital product, like a piece of software, but it also works at a business and strategy level. You know, there's an entire chapter in this book called Think Phrasal, which is all about how Apple and how Ken and how Shy Day came up with the name uh, iMac and, and the incredible story behind it. We're going to cover it. It is bizarre um, and it is innocent. And, and it's kind of amazing that this has ended up uh, carrying on um, in, you know, in, in uh, still prospering decades later with, with Apple continuing to use the kind of I blank naming framework. And so it's a really, really, really special book. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to cover it as well, too, just to give maybe a little per personal anecdote. I spent a number of years working on Apple's creative team early on in my career, uh, which was a wonderful experience. It's still, in, in many ways, the highlight of my experience working as a designer and as a creative. And, you know, I, I, we had a building that was badge access that nobody could get into. And the distinct memory I have every single day going into that office for years was I would badge into the door. And in order to get into the office, I would have to pass a wall. And on that wall were three simple words which were simplify, simplify, simplify. 
And the first two instances of that word were crossed out, almost as if it was too complicated or, or if it wasn't quite right. And so you're simplifying, simplifying, simplifying. And, you know, that idea, I think, boils down the essence of what this book is trying to get across. One thing that Apple has done, I would argue better than any other company, is truly embrace simplicity as a way to uh, attract customers, as a way to sell products, as a way to revolutionize something like, like the phone. You know, in Apple's instance of iPhone, was much simpler than than phones, uh, you know, at, the, at that moment in time uh, when it was when it was introduced. Um, but it also drives, I think, a lot of Apple's product strategy. You know, it shows up in ways that Johnny Ive or in Steve Jobs talked about focus and how focus was saying no to hundreds of other things so that you could say yes to just a handful of things. So it's a really powerful book. I won't belabor the point anymore, but I want to share some of those personal anecdotes. Let me just really quickly um, talk about who Ken is. I'm going to really quickly go through his bio because um, I think it's, 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 okay. So who is Ken Seagal? The author of this book, Ken Seagal, worked closely with Steve Jobs as an ad agency creative director, both at Next and at Apple. He was a member of the team that created Apple's legendary Think Different campaign, and he's responsible for the little eye that's a part of Apple's most popular products. Having created the original iMac that introduced his naming convention, he also served as a creative director for IBM, Intel, Dell, and BMW. And the reason I share all of this is, um, you know, it's really important. Like the one of the defining things that I think makes this book great is that it's written by somebody who was a close collaborator on important high profile work with Steve Jobs. So, you know, what I what I want to do is kind of read through a couple of chapters where we're going to um, switch between like wildly different stories from the naming of the iMac to the creation of the Think Different campaign to stories like the one I just told you at the beginning of the show all about Lori. And, you know, being ruthless with simplicity and in everything, including meeting sizes and who was attending those meetings. Um, and at the very end, I'll come back and I'll recap some of these ideas. We'll talk about how you can harness the concept of, of simplicity. Um, and, and the only other thing I'll say before we kick off is uh, this book, I think, was wonderful. One of the things I'm going to try to do a better job of going forward is also being frank about what I didn't think was great in the book. And in this book, there's a handful of chapters that literally when I got done with the chapter, I just put an X at the beginning of it because it, I just didn't, it didn't resonate with me. And um, it didn't resonate with me. It didn't have important ideas I thought connected. And so I'm going to cover the chapters that, I, that resonated and that I think have a lot of just really incredible value and insights in them, um, which is about two thirds of the chapter in the book. But there's a couple that we're not going to cover. You know, I didn't. Chapter seven, eight, nine, and chapter 11, think casual, think human, think skeptic, think ahead. We're not going to cover those. Again, the point of this for you and for myself is that this is the very best ideas from the book distilled in a way that hopefully you can grab onto, you can come back time and time again, and you can be able to get value out of. So uh, the way the book is structured is it's in it's structured into kind of 10 principles. Um, and the principles all have this kind of similar framework, it's think blank. And the first chapter is think brutal. And uh, I'll talk through some of those ideas and, and, and we'll continue to kind of go on. Um, and again, a lot of these ideas work on two levels. Uh, and one of the first ones is think, you know, so this first chapter is think brutal, which is, uh, you know, interesting framing. And, you know, the heart of it is really just that blunt is simplicity. And, uh, you know, not being blunt or meandering is complexity. And Steve didn't like complexity. He didn't like complexity in his working relationships any more than he liked it showing up in the product. Um, he was always going to tell you what was on his mind and he couldn't care less how you might feel about it. And, you know, I saw this prove out time and time and time again. I also think uh, if you're working with someone that you trust and respect, you're totally comfortable with that communication style. And so, yes, it feels jarring uh, from the outside looking in. I think working in closer proximity, I think it's a way that I, you know, it's wonderful for everybody to show up is just to be incredibly frank and direct about how you're feeling, but do it with compassion. Um, you know, and a lot of the ideas, and this is why I think this book, book works on multiple levels, is, um, you know, simplicity is about clarity. And one of the ideas in this chapter is that clarity propels an organization. Not occasional clarity, but pervasive, 24-7, in-your-face, take-no-prisoners clarity. And this is something Steve demanded. Steve demanded straightforward communication from others, and he dished it out himself. He had no patience for those who beat around the bush. He'd cut you off if you rambled. He ran his business as if there was precious little, precious little time to waste. Um, you know, and this idea that simplicity has a merciless side, that there's no almost when it comes to making things simpler. 
you know, simplicity in many ways is brutal because it's the process of basically bashing up against these like strongly held ideas that it can't be simpler or you can't approach it a different way. And in order to execute simplicity, I think reliably, it does re require you to be merciless um, and merciless at all levels. Apple's, you know, you can read a little bit from the chapter. Apple's longtime uh, agency, Shia Day, is so well known uh, for its clever t-shirts that it once published a best of book. One of its most famous t-shirts that attempted uh, to fight off the human instinct to settle for near perfection uh, was a simple t-shirt that read, good enough is not enough, which is such a simple phrase. Um, I tried to actually look up this series of, you know, this, this best of Shia Day t-shirts book, and I was not able to come up with anything. In fact, the only one I was able to find was t-shirts uh, around good enough is not enough. But I think that that's a wonderful, it's a wonderful phrase. Um, one of the ideas as well, too, is, you know, and this is again around, so it's all around this like brutal and being merciless. One of the ideas uh, that Ken talks about in the book is that, you know, settling for second best is a violation of the rules of simplicity. Uh, when you settle for second best, you plant the seeds of, uh, for disappointment, for extra work and for more meetings. And your challenge is really to become unbending when it comes to enforcing standards and, and you have to enforce them mercilessly. You know, in Apple's world, every manager has to be a ruthless enforcer of high standards. And I would argue that at every great company, that is exactly what happens is the company becomes uh, ruthless at, at maintaining high standards and it becomes ruthless at holding everybody internally to high standards. You need, you know, in my experience for this to really work, to have a truly high performing company, whether it's Apple or sub in any other company that you respect is uh, there is a ruthlessness to how it's run. And it, in order for it to work, everybody has to show up in the same way. So the company as a whole is showing up with high standards and every single person on the team is expected to hold those standards, maintain those standards, apply those standards in their own work. Um, you know, and one of the things that it's, uh, it was well known about Steve Jobs has definitely shows up in the book time and time again, is that he had a huge disdain for traditional corporate cultures. And I think a lot of that was just maybe a, you can interpret it as a huge disdain for conventional wisdom. There's a story from the early days of uh, Macintosh back at Chai Day when one of the agency guys eagerly introduced himself to, uh, to Steve on the set of a shoot. What do you do at the agency? Steve asked. I'm the account guy, he replied. Oh, so you're overhead, said Steve. Though it was said in jest, Steve wasn't kidding. You know, and there's this, uh, you know, this, this, I think, alludes to this, like, pull no punches side of Steve Jobs, where he would just call things out exactly as they were. And this is a great example. Most people would maybe not even make the connection, and they would definitely not be willing to call, uh, call somebody out on a set uh, for a team that they hired. But it's true. You know, if you're at an agency and you're on the account side, you are technically overhead. You know, another good example um, of just Steve being rude, uh, ruthless and kind of brutal in his communication style and how he worked with others. Um, is Steve, you know, Steve was interviewed. Uh, so it's a story from the book where Steve is basically choosing his team at Shia Day. And so he's interviewing a candidate that would manage his global business. So uh, what are you doing now, Steve asks. So Steve's asking the candidate. I'm the global account director of Nike at Widen and Kennedy, said our, said our man knowing he was holding a straight flush, just meaning that for Steve, he really respected Nike. Clearly, here's this candidate who's the global account director of Nike. Well, of course, Steve's going to like him. Steve paused. He was a big fan of the Nike brand. Nike's been great for a long time, said Steve. Thanks, said the candidate. So your job is just not to fuck anything up? Steve ended up approving of that hire. He just wanted to make sure that our man uh, understood the difference between working on an account in serious need of help like Apple at the time and maintaining a piece of business where the client is already firing on all cylinders. Similarly, Steve uh, was candid with his feedback when people were underperforming. Once he remarked, if you can't do a better job than that, you're going to have to replace yourself. That Steve was intolerant of stupidity as a matter of record. He respectably wasn't fond of employing stupidity. So if you were on Apple staff and wanted to retain that status, it was wise not to display your lack of smarts in a meeting with him. You just set him off and get it right between the eyes. So just to kind of recap, you know, this this first chapter is uh, it's an intense introduction, I, I think, into some of the sides of Steve that are polarizing. But I think it gets at the heart of simplicity, which is, you know, I think if you I was to bubble this up to a meta level, simplicity is very hard to achieve. Uh, you know, if you look around our world, our world is full of uh, just stupid amounts of complexity. And at Apple, you know, one of the experiences I had perpetually and it, it's talked about in the book is that simplicity also isn't easier, you know? And so in many ways you might think, uh, which you'd be kill kidding yourself, that um, 
you know, complexity is, is, is actually going to take the most work and simplicity is going to take the least work. And actually the inverse is exactly true. And the reason that it's true, you know, Steve talks about, uh, he has, he has, he has many remarkable quotes. One of, uh, the kind of, um, analogies that he uses, metaphors he uses that I really like is that basically getting from something complex to something simple is like peeling the layers of an onion. And that's exactly what it was like. And, you know, being a part of Apple's creative team, you just perpetually felt like we would get incredible outcomes because we would put in more reps than almost anyone else would. And, you know, the amount of reps that would just seem ridiculous and absurd to somebody else, just meaning, you know, it was not uncommon at all uh, for us to kick off a project and you would do tens, you know, you would probably, no joke, do 30 variations, 30 versions, 30 rounds of iterations to get to the final piece of product. And you were trying to do two things at once all the time. You were trying to both find ways to like up level and maybe uh, take something that was fine, but you thought you could frame or bring to life, meaning like just execute visually in a more compelling way. So you were trying to do that, which is almost like you're trying to maybe dial up the volume knob on these individual pieces of, of a given design. But the other lens we were applying ruthlessly is what could we remove or what could we merge or what could we decide to uh, strip out entirely? And this is something that showed up many other times in my life. You know, at, at Square, um, one of the one of the kind of remarks and perspectives that Jack Dorsey had that I thought was just immensely right was he really encouraged everybody on the team, especially PMs, to think of themselves as, as editors, meaning almost like an editor at a newspaper or an editor of a book. And, you know, and, and, and really that what was an editor doing, especially as you were bringing that, that skill set to being a PM, well, your job was to literally strip something down to its essence. And this is something on the creative team that we talked about all the time. Uh, that with everything that we did, our goal was really to strip it down to its essence where, where, where you retained what made it kind of sparkle and come to life. Because you, you, you can strip something down to the point that it doesn't resonate. You can strip something down to the point of just uh, being kind of utterly worthless, to, to be super frank. And so you have to strip it down, but not strip it down too much. You have to make sure that you what you retain kind of sparkles and brings it to life. But you were really trying to look at the essence. And so to try to, you know, bundle all of those thoughts together. That's how I think about what this first chapter is all about. It's about being brutal in your perspective of the world. It's about being brutal and applying standards and really high standards on yourself and your team. Um, and that that is a core piece of kind of simplifying and bringing simplicity to, to whatever you're doing. Okay, let's move on to the second chapter. Second idea here is all about thinking small. And again, this was the origin of that story about Lori. I'm going to try to you know build off of that but again, uh, the chapter starts with this wonderful line that Apple encourages big thinking, but small everything else. And, you know, just really quickly, there are many corollaries to this. Think small is a uh, like an irrefutable principle by which many incredible businesses and teams and companies have been built on. You know, Apple had or, or sorry, uh, Amazon had this kind of pizza rule where basically the teams you always wanted a team to be small enough that you could feed that team with just one single pizza. You know, Steve had a, had an idea with the early Mac team that he thought it should never be bigger than 100 people. And very clearly today, the team is definitely bigger than 100 people, uh, meaning the team of engineers and hardware designers that's working on, on Mac. Um, but in the early days, Steve had this ruthless perspective that it was a 100-person team. He never wanted the team to be any bigger. And if they wanted to add somebody to the team, they'd have to remove somebody to the team. Um, and, you know, so we're going to talk about how thinking small applies to the creative process. But again, you know, one of the stories, the, the story that the chapter starts off with is basically this meeting, you know, so Steve's going into one of his regular uh, creative reviews with Shia Day, you'd have this every single week with them. Um, and he identifies that there's somebody in the room that he's never seen before and, and calls her out. And basically, she, you know, gives what in many other companies would be a perfectly fine reason to stay in the meeting, which is, hey, somebody told me about this, I'm working on another piece of this, I, you know, I want to be a part of this conversation. At 99% of other companies, that would be completely acceptable. But again, at Apple, this just standards were ruthlessly applied. And, uh, and you know, it also introduces a concept that appears in the book many other times, which is the simple stick, which is this kind of uh, Steve uh, going into conversations or going into decisions and hitting a team or hitting an idea with the simple stick. And basically just time and time and time again being like, it should be simpler. Make it simpler. That's way too complex. Um, or in this instance, you know, he hit Lori with the simple stick and, and basically said, I don't think you're needed in this meeting and literally moved on mid-meeting. 
Um, and so I'm going to go back to the book because I think it, it connects it with some other principles that I think help it, it help us understand why Steve did this and, and why this was a good thing. Her crime, she wasn't necessary. What Lori experienced was a strict enforcement of one of simplicity's most important rules. Start with small groups of smart people and keep them small. Every time the body count goes higher, you're simply inviting complexity to take a seat at the table. Such a good line. So I'm going to have to say this again because this is one of the best ideas. Start with small groups of smart people and keep them small. Every time the body count goes higher, you're simply inviting complexity to take a seat at the table. The small group principle is deeply woven into the religion of simplicity. It's key to Apple's ongoing success and key to any organization that wants to nurture quality thinking. There's no such thing as a mercy invitation. Either you're critical to the meeting or you're not. It's nothing personal. It's just business. When Steve called a meeting or reported to a meeting, his expectation was that everyone in the room would be an essential participant. Spectators were not welcome. And all I'm going to say to add on to this is, Everybody listening should apply this in whatever you're doing, whatever companies you're running, whatever meetings you're running, and the way that you show up at work. This uh, I have found this to be absolutely uh, true. Uh, and, you know, I, it, but it's again, like, and this is one of the reasons I think this book is wonderful. Uh, all of these ideas are very simple and they, they honestly feel common sense. But uh, it, what's also true is that most ideas that feel simple and feel like something that is uh, is just like inevitable, like, of course, you should do that. These are also the things that take you have to literally bring energy into every meeting that you go into enough energy, not just to participate, but to be able to call out who's not in the room or to be able to drop someone from the invite. And it's very, very, very hard to do. Um and so I encourage everybody to bring this to the way that you show up, bring this into the way that you hold meetings. Your work will be better for it. Complexity normally offers the easy way out. Simplicity is never achieved through expectations. Truthfully, you can do a brutal thing without being brutal. Just explain your reasons. Keep the group small. Over the years, Apple's marketing group has fine-tuned a process that's been successfully repeated revolution by revolution. Project teams are kept small with talented people being given real responsibility, which is what drives them to work some crazy hours and deliver quality thinking because quality is stressed over quantity. Meetings are informal and visible pro uh, progress is made on a weekly, if not daily basis. I'm going to do a quick aside. Uh, one uh, essay, is, I guess technically it's a, it's a speech or a talk given by Ed Cat uh, Catmull that I want to uh, do uh, very soon is about keeping your mistakes small. Um, and it talks about really the creative process at, at Pixar that Ed Catmull and Steve, you know, helped create. And, you know, this idea of like informal meetings and visible progress being made, uh, you know, this is very true. At, at Apple, when we were doing creative work, uh, we were doing on, on some sort of, you know, uh, creative project. And this project could be spanning four or five months. We would do creative reviews every single day uh, in some form or fashion. And, uh, you know, at Pixar, one of the immutable laws that they have um, that they've come up, come that they've arrived at over time and, and enforced ruthlessly is just this idea that the team, if you're on a movie, if you're on a project, you will look at work that's happening every single day. And, you know, again, this sounds very simple. It sounds very straightforward. It's, it's also very hard uh, to, it's very hard to create and it's very hard to enforce. And the reason is for, for really two reasons. One. Uh, the subtext of creative reviews is that you're judging creative work. And most people's interpretation of that is that you're actually judging the person that created it. And, and I think one key unlock to really being able to do daily reviews in a great way is making sure that I, uh, uh, and, and I'll talk about in a second, a couple of tactics we would use, but making sure that, you know, the discussion is about the work and not about someone's contribution to the work. And, you know, a really simple example that I give um, whenever I talk about this, uh, and, you know, I would encourage everybody here that does creative reviews, and that could be something as silly as you're sitting down with someone on your team thinking through a plan and you want to give feedback on it, or you're literally reviewing a piece of creative work, could be a design for a logo or a product. Um, but one of the techniques we would use is just doing reviews by asking great questions. And this sounds really silly, but if what I, what I have found to be extremely true is when I talk with people about what a creative, what the purpose of a creative review is. Most people think that it's to basically a cast judgment. Like it's, you know, if, if I'm the stakeholder or if I'm someone who's making the final call, creative reviews are really where I cast judgment on the work. And I say, I don't like this. I like this. That actually, I think is the completely wrong way to think about a creative review. And I'll tell you why. 
uh, when you treat a creative review as casting judgment, you are only ever going to be as smart as whoever is casting that judgment. And I would you know, say that even the best people I've worked with are very volatile in terms of their, their judgment. What you want to create is an environment that uh, it, where intense questioning and curiosity is rewarded and, and is encouraged. And so one of the really simple things we would do at Apple, um, and I apply this today, is when we did creative reviews, there, I would say 10% or less of the conversation about was about what we liked or didn't like and, and was kind of from a judgmental perspective. The vast majority of the conversation was asking questions. And, and, uh, and so as an example, you know, if you were looking at something and say you didn't like the color, you wouldn't say, I don't like that color. You would say, you know, um, as I'm looking at this page, one of the things that's catching my eye is that we're using, say, this color purple in the, in the hero. You know, is that the right color? Is that what we should be using? How do we arrive at that? And what's amazing is if you, if you make that small tweak, at, as opposed to casting judgment, and you're asking questions, it unlocks, I think, a world of possibilities and it creates an environment where the work can just get better and better and better. But it also creates an environment where everyone is, uh, you're naturally uh, and continuously creating alignment because you're talking about the work constantly and you're all netting out, or at least you understand the rationale behind why you're making the decisions you're making. Weird aside, I'm going to cover this essay, this, this speech from Ed Kotmull, um, but it applies here. You know, at Apple, uh, you know, they have this ruthless process um, that's not, uh, it's not anything crazy, but one of the pieces of it is just meetings are informal, they're discussions, it's not formal reviews, um, and, you know, you, you want to see visible progress. Back to the book. Most businesses follow an instinctive but misguided principle. The more crucial the project, the more people must be thrown at it. The operative theory is that more brains equals more ideas. That's hard to argue with, except that only occasionally do more brains mean better ideas. This is, I, I love this perspective. To say that putting more people on a project will improve the results is basically saying that you don't have confidence in the group you started with. Either that or you're just looking for an insurance policy which also means you don't have a lot of confidence in the group you started with. What you're really saying is that you don't have the right people on the job. So fix that. Again, so simple, very, very, very challenging to do and to do tactfully and to do well and to do consistently. Quality of work resulting from a project is inversely proportional to the number of people involved in the project. I wouldn't say that that's true all of the time, but I would say in creative work especially and in in work that's exploratory or novel, or you're trying to do something uh, truly new, you're trying to uh, take something from zero to one that's very different from what exists today, that is absolutely true. The quality of work resulting from a project increases in direct proportion to the degree of involvement by the ultimate decision maker. Steve understood and appreciated the creative process, which in certain ways is the relative absence of process. He got his ideas, he got that ideas needed to be nurtured and protected. He knew um, that machine-like analysis would not magically yield creative brilliance. He knew that if he enabled a small group of smart people, good things would happen, even if those results weren't entirely predictable. So that entire chapter is just basically applying the concept that uh, you want to, uh, and you know, I think these are linked. Like the first chapter is all about being brutal uh, in, in terms of applying standards. And I think one of those standards is you want to always think small. You want to have small groups of smart people. You want to push people to to uh, create something with the minimum amount of resources needed to needed to do that. Um, you know, and just this idea that I think that yields better work. In my experience, it's absolutely true. I wouldn't say it's true for everything. It's not true for something. Um, you know, I think there are some things that are complicated enough that you need to have, uh, you know, a, a broader group, but for critical decisions, for really difficult or really novel things, a small group of smart people held to high standards uh, is absolutely the right way to go. Building off on that, you know, there's another chapter that follows it, which is all about thinking minimal, uh, which is similar but different. I'm going to share one of the stories. In 1997, at Apple's annual WWDC event, Steve shared his beliefs around simplicity. So Steve talking. People think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on. But that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred other good ideas that there are. You have to pick carefully. I'm actually as proud of the things we haven't done as the things we have done. Innovation is saying no to a thousand things. Love this. One, one of the uh, great anecdotes is very, very Steve response. But one of the great anecdotes in the book is... Um, when Mike Parker, who uh, was the former president and CEO of Nike, asked Steve for advice about where to take Nike, and Steve volunteered the following advice, which is ruthlessly simple. 
Nike makes some of the best products in the world, products you lust after, abs- just absolutely beautiful, stunning products, but you also make a lot of crap. Just get rid of the crappy stuff and focus on the good stuff. What's amazing here is, um, you know, if you go and do a little bit of homework about when Steve came back to Apple, this is exactly what Steve went and did. He basically, uh, you know, went and looked at the product line, realized that most of it was absolute shit, uh, got rid of that and and started off on a new set of products, basically kept the products that were good and started off on a new set of products um, with at least a six month uh, lead time. That was also the reason that the Think Different campaign was created was Steve came back. He knew that it was going to take time to fix the product lineup. And so he needed to be able to create some you know, positive um, sentiment, so reinvest in the brand, give people something to be excited about as it related to Apple as he, as he was fixing the products and, and getting stuff back that people would actually like. Um, as Steve often said, Apple is very good at saying no. It actively resists the temptation to make new products simply because it can. And one of the anecdotes here, and I thought these were kind of, you know, beautiful, and this is the parts of the book that work at the business and strategic level, is kind of reflecting on two things, which is, uh, you know, uh, one of the problems that most successful companies face is this product proliferation, just having way too many products. And another, uh, you know, issue, and I've seen this countless times myself, is uh, uh, getting overly complex with who your target customer is. And we'll talk about it in a second, but if you go and look at Apple's website, say go on any page, one of the things that is actually remarkable if you stop and think about it is that Apple could have different copy for college students, different copy for professionals, different copy for people that work at home. You know, it, it, it serves, you know, look at any instance, look at like an, uh, um, look at like the, uh, uh, the, like, a, like a computer as an example. You know, you could, like an iMac as a professional computer, it, you could use it at your office, you could use it at home. You could imagine two completely different marketing stories just focused on office versus home. Um, you know, similarly, take the MacBook Pro and you could think about talking to different people that use it, people that use it just for spreadsheets and browsing, people that use it for um, complex software. What's amazing is that Apple it merges these all down into a single customer profile. Um, and, and because of that, they can keep their marketing messaging really simple. So we'll come to that in a second. Let's talk about product proliferation. Many companies can't stop themselves from responding to every opportunity. Again, this goes back to this idea of Steve having to be really good at saying no, Apple having to be really good at saying no. Um, you know, and this, this stems from trying to please every customer and close every sale. When in fact, most companies would be better served by making their product lineup logical and easier to navigate. Choosing the path of simplicity, Apple elects to do just a few things, but do them incredibly well. It builds a large and loyal following, not because of the products it can make, but because of the products it chooses to make. It makes premium products only. It's happy to see the market for low-end products to anyone who cares to take it. Let's talk about, uh, you know, simplifying the target customer. So this is giving an, an anecdote of basically um, Apple's approach uh, at a time when Dell and IBM were, were powerhouses, you know, and today that's not so much the case. Um, and so it was a little bit of a different time. You know, the PC companies at the time were churning out different models for small business, big business, education, uh, government, and consumers of every stripe. They offer more choices now than ever before and make little profit on each. Apple, anchored by its belief in simplicity, has evolved in a very different way. Rather than splinter its, cust- uh, its computer marketing efforts among many different types of customers, it generally focuses on one. It simply sees customers as people. It markets its product based on the belief that its customers aren't looking for a great home computer or a great business computer. They're looking for a great computer, period. It's a vastly simpler way to sell a product, more cost efficient as well. Apple's one marketing message serves all, giving customers credit for having the intelligence to self-select the model that best meets their needs. Some home users may feel they need uh, the high-powered Pro machine. Some business use- users may feel they uh, need the basic entry model. All's good. Remember, being complicated is easy. It's simplicity that requires serious work. Minimizing product lines and consolidating target audiences requiring, requires an organization that's willing to take a long, hard look at itself. Steve looked at pretty much everything with the idea of cutting it down to its essence. Whether it was a new product or a new ad, he had an instant allergic reaction to any suggestions that might add complication. Uh, One of the things here we'll we'll talk about, uh, so this is another wonderful story. Um, And again, this is why I love that the book's written by someone who closely collaborated with Steve on ambitious things where you have to make these really tough calls and including calls that uh, can feel very risky in the moment 
that you have to have that conviction are going to pay off and that the risks are going to be worth it. And so these are judgment calls. They're subjective. It's very difficult. One of the other points, and I'll get to the story right after this. One of the other points related to this that I just want to call out is um, one of the points that Ken makes, which I really appreciated, is that simplicity is brutally difficult and it's brutally difficult for everyone, including Steve. And so uh, this story is going to be an instance where Steve struggles with simplicity. And, and, you know, and so in most cases, he, he is the champion of simplicity and he's rooting for simplicity, but it's hard. And there are times where you do, you know, all of us will fall prey to the siren song of complexity that that's, you know, it's in this one instance is going to be better if I don't approach simplicity. This is a great story about that. Human beings are a funny lot. Give them one idea and they nod their heads. Give them five and they simply scratch their heads. Or even worse, they forget you mentioned all those ideas in the first place. Minimizing is the key to making a point stick. Though this is common sense, it may also be the most violated principle in marketing or any other business. Your point will be more quickly understood and more easily remembered if you don't clutter it up with other points. Your point will be more quickly understood and more easily remembered if you don't clutter it up with other points. Strangely, some of the most brilliant people on earth sometimes need to be reminded. At one agency meeting with Steve Jobs, we were reviewing the content of a proposed IMAC commercial when a debate arose about how much we should say in the commercial. The creative team was arguing that it would work best if the entire spot was devoted to describing the one key feature of this particular IMAC. Steve, however, had it in his head that there were four or five really important things to say. It seemed to him that all those copy points would fit comfortably in a 30-second ad. After debating the issue for a few minutes, it didn't look like Steve was going to budge. That's when a little voice started to make itself heard inside the head of Lee Clow, uh, who is the leader at Chi, uh, at Chi at Day. And Lee Clow is legendary. At some point, I hope to do a book or a profile on him, but I haven't had a chance yet. Um, so Lee Clow is making an appearance in this story. He decided this would be a good time to give Steve a live demonstration. Lee tore five sheets of paper off his notepad. Yes, notepad. Lee was laptop resistant at the time and crumpled them into five balls. Once the crumpling was complete, he started his performance. Here, Steve, catch, said Lee as he tossed a single ball of paper across the table. Steve caught it no problem and tossed it back. That's a good ad, said Lee. Now catch this, he said, as he threw all five paper balls in Steve's direction. In Steve's direction. Steve didn't catch a single one and they bounced on the table and floor. That's a bad idea, said Lee. People will always respond better to a single idea, uh, to a single idea expressed clearly. They will tune out when complexity begins to speak and said, when in doubt, minimize. It's such a great principle. When in doubt, minimize. One of the other chapters that I really liked is about this idea of think thinking motion, which is uh we get to in a second, but I think it talks about how just the need to be able to sustain kind of a fever pitch in the work and a need to sustain progress and basically to push as always between time and resources and what you want to try to create. When Steve Jobs retook the helm at Apple, the biggest problem was the product line. When he told uh, what he told us was consistent with what he had said in a Business Week interview right before he'd agreed to return. The products suck. There's no sex in them anymore. Common sense often says that when it's time to accelerate the decision process, um, it's time to, apl to apply the best tool available, which is a small group of smart people. Leonard Bernstein captured this idea perfectly when he said, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. I found the perfect uh, amount of time to be about three months, any less time and we'd compromise on quality, any more time and we'd invite overthinking. And I think I'll just be a quick aside on this. Um, this is like, there is absolutely a fulcrum between I uh, basically under investing, which is spending too little time on a problem, which is where you are absolutely what the choice that you're making at the end of the day is you're compromising on quality because you have say, you know, if you have sufficiently high standards uh, in terms of what you want to ship, you need to back that up. And one of the things that you need to back that up and be able to deliver is enough time for exploration, iteration, and to get to something that's really special. Because again, as we talked about at the beginning, getting something special takes more work. You know, getting something really simple that resonates takes takes more work, uh, takes more time and energy. And on the other end of the spectrum, and I love that that uh, you know Ken called this out. Uh, you can also invest too much time, and and what the end output of too much time is absolutely overthinking. And what's bad about overthinking is when you overthink, you question your decisions, you start to iterate on things that are perfectly fine. Uh, where and 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 basically the way that I've seen that show up is, you know, say you'll spend another three or four weeks. And those three or four weeks might move the needle 1%. And positively, sometimes it'll move it negatively. 
And when you're in that realm, you're definitely overthinking. So I just love, you know, this idea of connecting these ideas of uh, Leonard Bernstein's, you know, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. And then this idea that, you know, in, in Ken's experience at Apple found that three months was about right. And in my experience creatively, if you're working on something sufficiently ambitious, three months feels pretty great. Um, interesting. Uh, Bernstein's quote cites two essential elements of achieving greatness. Those apply well to Apple's world along with the dendums. One, again, aim unrealistically high. When Apple created the first iPod, it didn't set out to create a portable player that could accommodate music, movies, podcasts, and photos. It created a music player. The rest would come later. In other words, don't overreach. It's important to achieve greatness, but your project has to end on time and deliver what you've promised. Obviously, you shouldn't underreach either. You can't be so realistic that you produce something lackluster. Again, you have to find that fulcrum point. This is a balancing act between these two extremes, and it's your job to find that day in and day out. And the second principle, never stop moving. The project begins on day one and should consume people from the get-go. No timeouts allowed. Only when people are kept in constant motion do they stay focused with the right kind of intensity. Work isn't supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be gratifying. Fucking love <laughs> those two sentences. Uh, work isn't supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be gratifying concentrating and in this i i love so it's talking about um you know part of apple's simplicity is that the first version of products will all will be um revolutionary from a product experience perspective but uh, honestly underwhelming especially in hindsight as you see future iterations in terms of what it delivers uh for like functionality um and this really interesting just to think about that for a second but one of the insights in the book that i love is about why this is a benefit um, and i thought this was just so well said again speaks to st strategy and why simplicity is important from a strategic perspective as well concentrating on building the best possible 1.0 product gives apple a number of advantages beyond scheduling it normally allows the company to create a product that's not only revolutionary but illuminates an even more exciting path ahead a good example is iphone the 1.0 version of this product didn't even support apps, which quickly came to be the most revolutionary part of the platform. The original idea was that Apple would support only web apps developed in Safari. Creating products this way gives Apple the ability to recycle its leadership. Apple creates this revolution. Then while its competitors are working to catch up to the 1.0 version, it's already at work on the 2.0 version. Year after year, as long as Apple continues to innovate, it has the opportunity to renew its leadership. Apple also gets an interesting marketing advantage from these cycles as well. Since it falls upon Apple's competitors to prove they cre they've created a better device, they normally gravitate towards specification-heavy advertising. They feel obligated to point out that they have more megapixels, more USB ports, more whatever. Meanwhile, Apple continues uh, it, to, to market its products, uh, to make its products as it, always had, it, as it always has in an emotional, human manner, pointing out benefits rather than specs. You know, one of the, one of my favorite quotes uh, from Steve, just a perspective that he had was that Apple couldn't compete on speeds and feeds, which was, you know, it's kind of Bud's words for, um, again, you don't want to be competing on specs. You want to be competing on the totality of the product. Um, you want to be competing on the product experience. That's uh, one really important if you're going to uh, capture the luxury market or the high end market, which is Apple's, you know, one and only strategy. It'll seed the low end of the market to everybody else. Um, so it's an important to capture that high end of the product of, of the market. But again, I just love this idea that um, when you can create this cycle of introducing revolutionary products, uh, your competitors then have to market based off comparison. And the only way to do that is to basically lean into, uh, you know, individual uh, like like data points that where where they have some sort of an advantage. And it's typically something that never resonates with consumers. Um, I just think it's like a, such a interesting and well made point. Um, unless it currently has a breathtaking technology, Apple takes itself out of the spec comparison game and makes more meaningful connections with its customers. Okay, uh, we're going to move on and talk a little bit about the uh, the Think Different campaign. And this whole chapter is about thinking iconic. And uh, it's a little esoteric in some of what we're going to read. This is one of those that I think the examples resonate. I don't know if the ideas resonate. Um, so, so I'll make the point this way. Um, this is how I think about this Think Iconic principle. One of the things that Apple has always done a very good uh, job of is uh, creating iconic imagery and iconic products and iconic headlines to, to uh, market their products. Uh, what, do, what do I mean by that? Well, take an example of like the initial iPod campaign that was basically a human silhouette 
with a white cable, which was this defining aspect early on of the iPod and, and, uh, and earbuds um, and somebody dancing. You know, it's, it's interesting because it is iconic, meaning one that, that uh, it is, uh, it's singular. You know, there's no other brand that's created a, a campaign like that. It's iconic in that it's basically, again, going to that, like getting out of the spec comparison game and making a human connection. People didn't care. People, by and large, don't care about speeds and feeds. They care about the totality of the product and the experience, and they care about what it delivers. And it was such a great example of Apple realizing that what people wanted was music because of how it made them feel, because everybody loves music and their own types of music. Um, we all have a connection with it, and it marketed that. It you know it marketed and communicated from that perspective. And so, thinking iconic is definitely a a muscle that Apple has developed. It's a muscle that they've developed to communicate the benefits of their product. And it's a muscle they've developed in terms of like creating and sculpting products that literally the, the form factor itself, the UI itself is, is iconic. So we're going to talk about some examples, mostly around the Think Different campaign. The Think Different ads were a vivid reminder that a single iconic image can be the most powerful form of communication. As we developed the campaign, each ad consisted of one black and white portrait of an Apple hero, I'm bleeding off all sides of the page with nothing more than the Apple logo and the words think different place tastefully in a corner on television. The commercial that launched the campaign similarly used black and white film clips that captured the spirit of each individual over this series of images. Richard Dreyfus read a script that praised the crazy ones who dared to see things differently. The think different campaign couldn't have been simpler. Um, no matter where those black and white images appeared in magazines, on posters and on billboards, they registered with viewers in a nanosecond. Um, and one of the things in this in uh, this chapter that I really enjoyed is so it's, it's all about the Think Different campaign, um, but it's actually uh, it just has the text. So this is what speed, uh, this is what Steve Jobs said when he introduced the Think Different campaign at what I believe was WWDC. To me, marketing is about values. This is a very complicated world. It's a very noisy world, and we're not going to get a chance to get people to remember much about us. No company is, and so we have to be really clear on what we want them to know about us. Now, Apple, fortunately, is one of uh, the half a dozen best brands in the whole world, right up there with Nike, Disney, Coke, Sony. It's one of the greats of the greats, not just in this country, but all around the globe. But even a great brand needs investment and caring if it's going to retain its relevance and vitality. And the Apple brand has clearly suffered from neglect in this area in the last few years. And we need to bring, and we need to bring it back. The way uh, to do that is not to talk about speeds and feeds. It's not to talk about MIPS and megahertz. It's not to talk about why we're better than Windows. The dairy industry tried for 20 years to convince you that milk was good for you. It's a lie, but they tried anyway. Audience laughs, and the sales have gone down like this. Got Milk doesn't even talk about the product. Matter of fact, the focus is on the absence of the product. But the best example of all, and one of uh, the greatest jobs of marketing that the universe has ever seen is Nike. Remember, Nike sells a commodity. They sell shoes. And yet, when you think of Nike, you feel something different than a shoe company. In their ads, as you know, they don't ever talk about the product. They don't ever tell you about their air soles or why they're better than Reebok air soles. What, uh, what, what does Nike do in their advertising? They honor great athletes and they honor great athletics. Things who, uh, that's who they are. That's what they're all about. Apple spends a fortune on advertising. You'd never know it. So when I got here, Apple had just fired their agency and was in a competition with 23 agencies that, you know, four years from now, they'd pick one. And we blew that up and we hired Shiat Day, the ad agency that I was fortunate enough to work with years ago, who created some award-winning work, including the commercial voted the best ad ever made, 1984 by advertising professionals. And we started working with that agency again. And the question we asked was, our customers want to know who is Apple and what is it that we stand for? What do we fit in this world? And what we're about isn't making boxes for people to get their jobs done. Although we do that well, we do that better than almost anybody uh, that, than almost anybody in some cases. But Apple is about something more than that. Apple at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. That's what we believe. And that those people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. And so what we're going to do in our first brand marketing campaign in several years is to get back to that core value. A lot of things have changed. The market is a totally different place from where it was a decade ago. And Apple is totally different. And Apple's place in it is totally different. But values, core values, those things shouldn't change. The things that Apple believed in at its core are the same things that Apple really stands for today. 
And so we fought, wanted to find a way to communicate this. And what we have is something that I'm very moved by. It honors those people who change the world. Some of them are living, some of them are not. But the ones that aren't, as you'll see, you know that if they've ever used a computer, it would have been a Mac. The theme of the campaign is think different. Honoring the people who think different and who move this world forward. And it is what we are about. It touches the soul of this company. I hope you feel the same way about it that I do. Um, incredible speech. Incredible speech. Uh, incredibly true. Incredibly resonant even to today. Um, some more commentary about this. A company facing extinction will normally do whatever it takes to keep itself alive. Anything except increasing marketing costs, of course. So it takes a large degree of nerve to pour a good chunk of what's left into something as intangible as a new brand campaign. But that's just what Steve did. In a certain way, he seemed to feel liberated by Apple's predicament. He made it clear that Apple couldn't be withdrawing into a shell at a time like this. Now was its last chance to get out there and put its stake in the ground. The company had to invest in itself and invest Steve did. And again, this is commentary on Think Different. If you think about where the company was when it came up with this campaign, it was facing extinction. Steve came back as an interim CEO and didn't, wouldn't become CEO for a very long time, time later. Um, and he was in the, in the process of rebooting the company and the prospects were extremely grim. Um, and so, you know, I think this is just a, a point wonderfully made that uh, Apple's always been great at marketing and marketing is, is what the company's built a lot of success on, marketing and creating break, breakthrough products. And Apple made a call that most companies would not have made, which was to invest in marketing, branding, and advertising at a time where most other people, especially a CFO, would say we, we shouldn't do that. Um, talks a little bit about the tactics Apple used. By saying fewer things in more important places, Apple seemed to get more notice than companies like IBM, which had a vastly larger marketing budget. Again, your budget doesn't matter. It's how you apply it. Uh, Shiat's media chief, Monica Caro, made sure that the Think Different campaign appeared only in those places where it would achieve maximum notice and never in places that would degrade the message. These portraits of Think Different heroes never ran on the inside pages of a magazine. They ran only on back covers where they would shine on their own. But it was out in the real world that the ads had such a commanding presence. Billboards became a huge part of the effort, but only in the most prime locations. Apple started systematically locking up the most visible billboard locations all over the United States as they became available near airports, approaches to major cities, etc., Selling a brand campaign to a client is often like selling a 19-year-old on the benefits of starting a retirement account. The gains are just too far off in the future. They're in business to make money now. I'm going to go ahead and pause this episode for now. This is going to be part one of uh, Insanely Simple. Again, this is episode 173, and you can find the show notes, including all everything that I've talked through. All of my notes and takeaways for the book, it's 35 pages printed out. You can find this online at outlieracademy.com slash insanely simple. I'll be back with part two.